everyone. I hope everybody can hear me well. So I'm Luisa Antonia. Uh, so I'm, I'm a Antonia. faculty member in the School of Computer Science at the University of Guelph. Uh, but uh, as a University of Alberta uh, alumnus, um, it is my pleasure to introduce today Professor Chaba uh, Sepesvari. Uh, Professor Sepesvari is a Canada uh, CIFAR AI chair, the team lead for the foundations team at DeepMind, and the professor of computing science at the University of Alberta. He earned his PhD in 1999, 1999 from uh, Josef Attila University in Szeged, uh, Hungary. He has authored three books and over 200 peer-reviewed journal and conference papers. Uh, he serves as the action editor of the Journal of Machine Learning Research and Machine Learning, as well as on uh, various program committees. Uh, Dr. Cheveswari's interest is artificial intelligence and uh, in particular, uh, principled approaches to AI that use machine learning. He is the co-inventor of UCT, a widely successful Monte Carlo research algorithm UCT ignited much work in AI, uh, such as DeepMind's AlphaGo, which defeated the top Go professional Lisa Doll in a landmark game. This work on UCT won the 2016 Test of Time Award at uh, ECML PKDD. Uh, Chaba, I'll just uh, uh, pass this to you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction, um, and thanks for having me. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so I said that I'm going to talk about uh, progress in model-based reinforcement learning. Uh, I've been working on and off on this topic for like my entire career, I could say, I think. And uh, so I'm really excited about some recent progresses uh, in this area. So I want to share this excitement with you. Uh, if you have any questions in the meanwhile, I will also try to, you know, monitor. I have two computer screens. Uh, if you're raising your hand or whatnot, Louisa is, is going to help me, I guess, with those questions. Uh, anyhow, so if anything is unclear, then just like, please stop me and, and ask those questions. Um, all right. Um, so with that, I like to make a premise uh, for, for this talk, which is that, uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, why is it challenging to construct efficient model-based reinforcement learning methods, and uh, then talk about these uh, new developments that I'm excited about that should be addressing uh, these challenges. All right. Uh, so, but uh, to, um, to tell you a little bit about my background, uh, so um, I'm working mostly on theoretical aspects of uh, machine learning and, and reinforcement learning. And so this talk is going to be given from the perspective of uh, a person who is working on theory. And you might ask like why you are working on theory. And for that, uh, it is a little cartoon that uh, or joke that I think very well illustrates like what can go wrong maybe if you if we are lacking theory. I guess everyone knows this, but uh, I guess it's it's silly. Like, you might know this. This is an XKCD uh, cartoon. Uh, just one guy says, "This is your machine learning system." The other guy says, "Yeah, uh, you put the data into this big pile of linear algebra. They collect the answers on the other side." And then the first guy says, what if the answers are wrong? The second say, oh, just stir the pie until they start looking right. Well, OK, so this is not what we want to do, right? So uh, that's why I'm uh, working on theory. OK, uh, so this um, work uh, has been done over uh, a decade or even more, and uh, it involved a uh, large number of uh, great collaborators uh, whom you can see on this slide. And I uh, feel really privileged to, to work with uh, uh, these great people. Um, all right, so the talk is going to have two parts. Uh, in part one, I'm going to talk about the context. Uh, the purpose of this part is to introduce the challenge of uh, model-based um, 
approaches to, to reinforcement learning. So to understand these challenges, we should first talk about what is even reinforcement learning. I guess everyone kind of knows that. And then the different methods and then what are the models? What do we mean by model-based reinforcement learning? What there is a state of the art? And I'm going to talk about the specific challenges. So I'm going to identify three challenges. In the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about how these three challenges can be addressed and then we conclude. Um, so for the purpose of the talk, I'm mostly going to use uh, the framework Markov decision processes. And there was the reinforcement learning tutorial uh, by Pierre. Uh, introduced that. Uh, Pascal was also talking about reinforcement learning. So I, I guess like everyone kind of knows this framework. Uh, two things I want to know uh, about this. Uh, so the very first one is that uh, we do as if uh, we observe the state. So, so how does this framework work? Uh, so we have uh, M, uh, which is uh, this MVP. It has a state space, the set of states of actions bunch of transition uh, matrices uh, for each of the actions. We have some transition matrix, uh, and, and we have a reward associated with every uh, single transition. And the way it works uh, is that uh, you're at some state, uh, and, and you may observe the state. So this is the first thing that like you may or may not observe the state. Maybe you observe some function of the state, some stochastic. You arrive at home DPs. It's more complicated, so I try to keep it simple. You will see, even if you keep think, uh, things at this simple level, there are really nice problems that pop up. So let's just assume that uh, you can observe a state, and then as a function of your observation, uh, you, you make up your mind what action that you take, and as a result of that, uh, a random transition so that's uh, indicated by the dice, occurs to a new state, so that's S1, and along with the transition uh, as a function of the state as well, uh, you observe the rewards, so this is your reward. And basically, you, you sum up the rewards on your trajectory, maybe you're going to discount, so you have a discount factor here, which is uh, between zero and one, and your goal is to figure out a way of choosing these actions as a function of uh, maybe all previous observations, actually. But, uh, I mean, uh, the state kind of summarizes the observations, but if you're in a learning situation, then, of course, you're going to learn uh, about the environment. So the learning situation happens when you don't know these situations, and that's a, a setting of reinforcement learning. And then your actions are going to depend on, on past states as fast as you would have this uh, more complete figure than... Uh, than previously when every action depends on all previous observations as well. In any case, uh, you want to maximize uh, the total uh, expected discounted reward, which is also called the value. If you're starting from a fixed initial state or a fixed uh, distribution, then this is just like one number. And you try to, uh, to figure out how to control the stochastic process so that like, this, this value is maximized. Right, so this is, uh, I guess, quite standard, and, and we know how it works. So um, um, as I already alluded to, uh, we, we just use this as a background framework uh, to talk about that we want to contrast stochastic environment where there are random transitions, and we have these rewards. But the real problem is that the environment is unknown, and uh, and since the environment is unknown, uh, you're interacting with the environment, you have to learn about the environment. So this leads us to the first problem definition. So here I want to emphasize that um, reinforcement learning is less of, in my view, as a set of methods, but it's a set of problems that are interrelated. So, so first, I want to talk about these different problem settings. I call these problem settings. So the very first problem setting is the problem setting of online reinforcement learning. So here, the environment is unknown. Um, so you have this agent that's trying to learn about the environment. It's taking its actions and then uh, receiving observations. So maybe this is state observation, but maybe this is just like some function of the state. So, uh, 
you don't have to take it so seriously that you 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 uh, you, you can have you know like more uh, other types of observations, which can make the problem uh, much harder. But but that's that's how things are typically, and. Uh, so as the agent goes, the main thing is that the agent's just goal is just to maximize the total reward or the expected return. Uh, usually in this framework, uh, there is no discounting. You just care about like uh, even despite the fact that the environment is not known, can I design an, an ergotum that I act with the agent with? such that no matter what this environment is going to be, uh, in all of those environments, the agent's doing almost as well as if it knew the environment. So that's, that's the problem setting up online reinforcement learning. And uh, so that's just uh, one of the problem settings, but it's, it's a pretty important one. So a second problem setting uh, that we also often encounter is the setting of batch reinforcement learning, or you could say that this is offline. Uh, so in this setting, uh, you uh, have a bunch of um, observations uh, in the form of uh, state action reward sequences uh, that is collected offline. Uh, and then uh, you want to use this data uh, to drive the places. So here, here, the, here the problem starts from uh, with the data and, and you want to use the data in a computational way to get a policy such that if you're deploying this policy, you would replace this policy there, this is new policy, then it works well on the environment where the data collection happens. So this is called batch reinforcement learning. So this is a setting that uh, is very practical. It's also quite hard, quite challenging. Um, because the agent doesn't have, or the learning entity doesn't have an option of uh, creating new data. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite pre uh, prevalent in, the, uh, in applications, so it's quite important. All right. Um, so the last thing that I want to talk about is, is planning with the simulator. And uh, most of uh, current work in, on reinforcement learning, this, this deep reinforcement learning uh, happens uh, using the simulator. And so here, the problem is, uh, is different. Uh, you could use a simulator just to, to simulate what happens in online learning, but most of the time, uh, you could uh, also define this other problem, which is to use a simulator to derive the policy uh, with a, huge number of queries, like uh, accessing the simulator only a few times, uh, and drive the policy so that if you deploy that policy in the simulator, then you get a high reward. So in this case, you don't care about how much reward you, you get. You care about uh, like how many times you have queried the simulator in, in this loop, right? So the query of the simulator. And this is a pure optimization setting. So you don't care about like how much reward you would get during optimization. This is useful if you build a model. So that's, that's how it relates to um, our setting. Uh, it's useful if you build a model and you, you want to use that model to derive a good policy, right? So then you, you don't care about whether in the simulated environment you collect a lot of reward, you want to uh, quickly arrive at a policy uh, that gives uh, good performance when, when it's deployed. All right, so these are the three problem settings, uh, the main problem settings of RL. And of course, uh, they are related to each other. Uh, so for example, online reinforcement learning could use batch reinforcement learning because you can save the data uh, from past interactions and then algorithms that are developed for batch reinforcement learning become useful for online reinforcement learning. Uh, online reinforcement learning, as I already uh, hinted on, uh, can also use planning with a simulator. When you build a simulator, build a model, given the data that you collected, and then you try to use the simulator uh, to come up with a good policy, uh, 
the dine algorithm would be one example of that uh, that is doing this. Uh, Chaba, so, sorry to yes. sorry to interrupt. So, sorry to so interrupt. it seems there are some problems sorry, with uh, some problems with, uh, with with the sound. So the people sound. are saying that they okay. can't hear you well. So I'm right. not sure if you so can do if I come closer, your side, is it any better? Is it any better this way? I think at the moment it the is, moment but you are breaking up at time, uh, up at times. times. Oh, that's strange. Okay. Uh, well, well, maybe let's try again okay. and see how it's, going. Sorry. how it's going. Sorry. So, yeah, I wonder whether it was because of uh, mic uh, sensitivity issues or is it because of connectivity? All right. Anyways, let's let's monitor the situation. Right, right, and, right, uh, right now I can hear you well. Okay. So maybe I would just like a little bit too far from the screen. Shabad, you also do you uh, do you have two um, two zooms open because there's a lot of echo. Okay, I can close one of them, but uh, so the only okay. downside is that then I won't see any. any. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I close the other one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. How about now? Like, do you still have the echo? Well, uh, no, it seems to be. Uh, no, seems yes, to be. I still do have the echo. That's a little bit. Okay, so I closed the other Zoom. Uh, do you okay. still have the echo? Uh, I need to. Let's. Yes. When I speak, okay. I, I can hear me. I don't have the echo for you. I just have the echo when someone else is speaking, basically. Yeah, I don't think that it was coming from my computer. Sorry okay. about that. Okay. Okay. Let's let's try uh, this way. Um. Yeah. Okay. Um. Anyhow, uh, so batch uh, reinforcement learning uh, could use uh, planning with a simulator. Uh, again, you can build uh, a model and then you can just run your planning algorithm. Uh, and uh, as I already said, planning with a simulator is really RS optimization. And uh, so when we are asking questions like, can we beat humans at a certain game? Uh, then uh, we are really asking the question of whether uh, doing these problems an optimization problem, we can get a good performance. But this is not online RL, right? Um, so uh, just to, to orient uh, everyone in the space of our problems. All right. Um, so in today's era, uh, what we see is a lot, there are lots of exciting results coming out from various labs around the world uh, where neural networks, uh, usually deep, uh, are combined with reinforcement learning. And uh, they keep surprising us of uh, what level of complexity they can achieve. So, uh, so here are a few examples that they haven't probably heard about, uh, like DeepMind's DQN uh, first demonstrated that um, uh, a number of uh, other games, uh, the simulated environments, a single other algorithm can achieve uh, Human level control and beyond. Uh, Alpha Zero was defeating uh, using an RL algorithm, a world champion in Go, and so on and so forth. Um, so these are examples of what RL can accomplish uh, together with neural networks, and they are really uh, motivating and inspiring. Uh, so, what's inside the box? Uh, so, this is uh, kind of like a blueprint of what you could. Uh, see if you open the box of an RL algorithm. In the background, you see this, this neuron. So neural networks are going to be used everywhere. So in general, when uh, you interact with the environment, you get collisions, not really the state of the environment. And because of that, you may need to be able to construct some states. And the state could go to the model, could go to a function approximation, to, to a critic, and, and it could go to a policy or an actor. Um, uh, and, um, you have all of, uh, all these interactions and, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you have these boxes, you fill them with different, uh, architectures, uh, maybe just algorithms, maybe the, the actor is going to be like a big planning algorithm. 
So there are many, many different ways of filling all these boxes. So the, the point of the slide is that you have this uh, really high level picture, uh, different modules, uh, and uh, all the different models uh, can interact with each other and can be filled with different algorithms. And you see because of this, a huge variety of uh, different algorithms coming out. All right. Um, so what about models? Uh, so how do models uh, fit uh, in the picture? So this is uh, the focus of the talk. So why? So first, why do we care about models? We care about models because they uh, encapsulate abstractions. Uh, they allow us to express invariances, suppress irrelevant details, and they allow a stronger form of generalization uh, that can be achieved through planning or inference. Um, so those are really great reasons to have models, but like what is an example, for example, of uh, an invariance? So a very simple example would be that, well, if you have this sequential process, then in every run of the process, in every step of the process, you have the same dynamics happening. And so you can, uh, so this is an example of time invariance, right? So the, the, the state dynamics doesn't change over time, you have stationary to here. And if you build a model, then the model can exploit us. So this is a very simple example of invariances. Uh, so an example of suppressing irritable details would be that when you have this hiker who wants to get to its camp and it doesn't need to know all the fine details of the environment just to make a plan, right? And so you can abstract away states, actions, and time. And uh, with this, you can plan uh, much further ahead in time, and you can solve much bigger problems, and you can uh, potentially generalize to uh, unseen situations. So what are the tools that people use these days to build models? Uh, so first, uh, I already mentioned, uh, you may not observe the state, in which case uh, you may want to have uh, a state estimation component. So that you use a big neural network that uh, tries to compress past observations and predicts uh, current observations to, to create a compressed representation. You can throw in the dynamics, the actions there. So that's uh, how you could uh, arrive at a state estimator. Um, and then once you have uh, some representation of the state, then you can uh, use other neural networks or Gaussian processes or graphical models or whatnot. It's uh, totally up to you to build these uh, forward models. Uh, so the forward model takes uh, a state or an agent constructed state, takes an action, and then outputs a new state. Uh, could be deterministic or it could be stochastic. Uh, so maybe it could also output a distribution over the next day. So there are various ways of formulating this. Uh, so that's the second tool of forward models. Uh, and then uh, people often uh, want to abstract uh, time and then you could introduce hierarchies. I'm not going to talk much about this, uh, but it's, it's a very useful uh, tool and technique that is complementary to the previous ones. So here's an example of uh, how uh, all of this could come together. In the recent paper, uh, uh, you just have uh, these inputs, which are the frames, and you take four of them, and then you uh, create this discrete latent state representation. And you have the action that's also conditioning that. And uh, so you try to create this discrete latent representation in such a way that uh, with it, you can predict future frames of that. So here, uh, the model is built on the premise that you're, uh, you'll be able to predict uh, future observations. So that's just one example, and you can see that well, it's, it's not simple to, to build the models. Um, Hi, All right. Uh, Tom, tell yes. So uh, again, it seems to be um, not going too well. So I'm not sure if it's uh, your microphone. So I thought maybe we can take a short break and uh, answer a question that we had on YouTube. Okay. Um, so the question was, what's the difference between model-based reinforcement learning and optimal control? Optimal control. 
Okay, so uh, Optima Control is concerned with a large number of different questions. Um, classically, in Optima Control, people were interested in um, for what class of models you can calculate uh, in closed form Optima policies. So those were the early days. Then people turn to computational, more computational approaches, uh, and uh, we're asking the question how to compute in an efficient way uh, Optima controllers or actions that Optima controllers would take. And reinforcement learning is like this big bag of things, and model-based reinforcement learning is also the, the same big bag of things. Uh, so. Uh, as I described, in reinforcement learning, you have three types of uh, problems. So one of the problems, planning with a simulator, uh, seems to be addressing, by and large, the same questions. Um, and so uh, I would say that, that that is pretty much the same question. Like, in my view, model, like, Optima Control uh, is really trying to answer the question how to, to find good actions. Uh, in, in this sequential situation. Um, so they are largely overlapping in that regard. Uh, so that... Okay, so um, the question is, uh, so I talked about all these uh, tools that you could use for building models. The question is, are we doing this right? And uh, I'm gonna talk quite a bit about this. Uh, so it seems that many of the existing approaches that people try, uh, they pick a single model rather than representing the uncertainty that is left after the model is estimated and then dealing with that uncertainty in some way. And I'm going to argue that that's, that's not a good idea. Uh, so maybe it would be better to, to represent the inherent uncertainty that you have after you have seen a finite amount of data while interacting with the world, with the environment. Next slide, please. Next slide, okay. Uh, I lost space. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Uh, I just, I can't find your slide. It's somehow disappeared. Is it okay? Like yeah, 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 just a sec, just, I think I'm okay. here, voila, sorry. <laughs> All right, okay. So, um, but like, what's what's the situation actually out there? Like, uh, which of the results that I was describing earlier as uh, nice positive surprises uh, use model, use models of the environment, and only one of them, uh, where um, in Go, you use actually the rules of the game in a planning component uh, to strengthen your algorithms, the error algorithms, and, and none of the others are using models. So next slide. Um, so why is that? Next slide. So I'm going to identify three challenges. The first challenge is that inferential planning can be really, really hard even if you have a good model. Next slide. The next challenge is that the model is not the same as reality. Uh, so you may have a good planner, you may solve this planning problem efficiently, but even in that case, if your model was not the same as reality, then you may end up not doing the right things. Next slide. So, and the third challenge is what to model. Uh, so what to include in the model, like we saw this example where uh, the model was built on the premise to predict the pixels uh, of an image. Next slide. Uh, is, that, is that a good thing? So Pascal uh, gave uh, the keynote on the first day uh, of this conference and uh, he was talking about uh, um, using images uh, in a clever way, uh, in a better way than just like throwing in big CNNs uh, and extracting information from there. And he mentioned that 
uh, self-supervised learning, images are rich, uh, is content, self-supervised learning can be really powerful and you can build these powerful models. But he also mentioned this example of Beam Rider, which is in the lower right corner when all the background is moving and there is a small bullet. And you really need to know where the bullet is because that's the important part. But if the algorithm doesn't know about that and it just tries to reconstruct images, then it may easily miss the bullets. And an approach that is test agnostic and just cares about you know reconstruction errors might easily miss the most important information on the images, right? So it's challenging to know what you want to model and what you want to ignore. Um, next slide. So uh, let's first talk about the first challenge, efficient planning. Next slide. Uh, so planning is just a computational problem. You have a model, and you want to extract a policy from it. And um, next slide. So the question is how to do this in an efficient way. And, and here, the very first lesson is that you can't do this. Uh, so in most of our problems, the state space is going to be huge. Oftentimes, the action space is also really huge. And you can't even afford polynomial time computations. Yet, uh, we know uh, from theory that uh, computing an optimal policy in uh, MDPs is going to be p-complete. So that means that you can't hope to be able to come up with good policies or the optimal policy in this case. Uh, if uh, the size of the state space is exponential and and are like it's it's growing really fast with the number of state variables, uh, which is called curse of dimensionality, and like most of the time you can't compute the optimal policy. So then, next slide. Uh, what can we compute? Uh, so how do we deal with these large models? You could build search trees. You could use five function approximation. You can have hybrids tweak the models. I'm going to talk about two of these, uh, using wave function approximation and tweaking the models. Next slide. So value function approximation is, is not a new idea. It started uh, together with uh, the advent of um, dynamic programming. And when people realize that you need to use feedback, they also realize that this computation is hard. And the very first thing that they propose is that maybe you could uh, just like imagine that you have this optimal action value function. So the optimal action value function is known. It's a function that maps state action pairs to values. And it's known that if you knew the optimal action value function, it would be easy to compute an optimal policy. You just uh, choosing every state the action that maximizes this optimal action value function. That's called a greedy policy. It's called greedification. And uh, to help yourself, uh, you're going to assume some prior information uh, in a sense that uh, you could assume that this optimal action wave function lies close to the span or in the span of some features that assign you know, vectors, uh, the dimensional vectors features uh, to state action pairs. The question then, uh, if you had access to a simulator that can uh, generate transitions from a model, um, and you can access the rewards and the underlying features at any state action pair of your choice. And you have this assumption that uh, the optimal action wave function lies close to the span of the features. Can you then design an algorithm that no matter what uh, the underlying MDP is, and no matter what the features are, uh, can come up with a good action at a given state? Uh, with not too many queries issued uh, to the model and not too much computation. Um, next slide. Um, so there are many algorithms, and uh, many of the popular algorithms are based on this idea of uh, successive approximations. So the observation here is that the optimal action value function is the fixed point of an operator called a BAM on optimality operator. And now, if you assume that Q lies in the span of some features, maybe you just introduce a projection, and then you hope to solve for this projected equation that's, uh, that's shown in the middle of the screen. You have this pi t. Uh, you're trying to solve for the fixed point of that. And you just like 
introduce these successive approximations when you're iterating. And uh, many of the algorithms, interestingly, in reinforcement learning are based on variations of this idea. For example, DQN is uh, essentially implementing this in the context of nonlinear function approximations. So no linearity there, but it's basically the same idea. And so why, why would even this work? And we know that um, this is not necessarily a good idea. So this iteration can explode. So it's an unstable iteration in general. If you give me an arbitrary phi, uh, even if a Q had a fixed point here, would be equal to Q star. So even after the projection, there is no problem. Like Q star lies in the span, uh, then this fixed point iteration can blow up. And so that was shown in an example uh, by John Titiklis and Ben Monroe in 1996. Um, so next slide, uh, although we have a question, uh, I don't know, like maybe, uh, someone can check what a question is. Uh, and, um, and so like what else can you do? Uh, so the other approach was also proposed very early on, uh, by these two, two gentlemen and maybe they were precursors to, to them as well, uh, which is called approximate linear programming. It turns out that. It's not only the fixed point activation, but you can write a so-called linear program. And if you read out the solution to the linear program, it's the optimal value function from which you can read out optimal policies. Uh, so we like linear programs because they are convex. The problem here is that there are too many variables of the linear program, too many constraints. So these gentlemen propose to use linear function approximation to reduce the number of variables. So here, the program uh, is over this parameter vector theta, which is d-dimensional, so there are only d three parameters, regardless of the number of state action pairs. But uh, here, the constraints are written in a, in a compact form. The number of constraints is equal to the number of state action pairs. That's too many. So the question is, what can you do? And so you have this collage of this uh, wonderful people who have all worked on this problem, and there are many more, just included a few of them to show you that like a lot of people uh, spend a lot of time on, on trying to crack of uh, how to uh, solve uh, linear programs of this type, constraint generation, randomization, and so, so forth, lots of ideas. Um, next slide. And so, uh, we took a different approach. So here I want to uh, just tell you about a work that I, I did with uh, two colleagues, uh, Chantru Lakshminar and Shala Badnagar, um, uh, where uh, rather than thinking about like what to do, like how to computationally uh, approach this problem, that you have too many constraints, uh, we, just, uh, we just assume that someone decides to uh, project these many constraints using some non-negative valued matrices to a low dimensional space. And we wanted to understand how to choose these matrices to get good, uh, good value function approximation. So good results if you read out uh, the solution to this projected or linearly reduced uh, linear program. Next slide. So what turns out is that at least in one special case, uh, we can get some really good results. So the special case is when uh, the features at arbitrary states can be written as positive linear combinations of features at a few selected states, which we call uh, the states in the set, we call it the core set. So this course, it only depends on the features. It doesn't depend on uh, what the MDP is. And if you can identify a small core set, next slide, um, then it turns out that uh, if you solve the resulting uh, linear program, um, so that you would uh, have this binary matrices. So you throw away basically all the constraints that are for states that are not at the core set. And then you can show that uh, the resulting solution enjoys this error bound. It's uh, basically, if you have an absolute approximation error, then you're going to blow up this absolute approximation error by this factor of 1 over 1 minus gamma. This is for this quantity problem. This is my dependence. So we expect this dependence to, to show. Uh, so altogether, this shows that this is a viable approach. Next slide. 
so this is not really a computational procedure yet uh, because uh, even after you find the core set, you have to deal with the constraints and in the course, uh, the, the constraints, uh, there is the transition probabilities and transition probabilities are over all possible next states and there could be billions of those. So how can we avoid enumerating all the states there? Uh, so with joint work with a uh, current student of mine, Roshan Sharif, uh, uh, still in progress, uh, we show that uh, you can do this uh, by introducing a clever uh, sampling algorithm. So you can have an algorithm that works uh, for any feature set, as long as you can find a small core set for that feature set. And uh, that issues only uh, polynomially many queries, uh, regardless of the number of uh, states. Next slide. So uh, to summary, summarize this, uh, so this uh, result is agnostic to the choice of the MDPs. Uh, it's uh, computational efficient as long as you can find this small core set. And uh, it's also agnostic to the choice of the features up to the extent that, again, you can find a small core set. So the lesson that uh, I, I drew from this research is that uh, it's kind of interesting, and we don't know whether this corset is really fundamental or not, but if you uh, add this extra condition, uh, then you can uh, design really efficient planning algorithms that work uh, for really large-scale problems. Uh, so there are many questions, of course, like uh, how to replace linear function approximation with nonlinear one, uh, but... Uh, yeah, that remains for future work. Uh, okay, next slide. So there are other approaches, and I'm not going to go into this, uh, but I find this really cute. Uh, so you can, uh, if you assume that the transition model is uh, in a in a factored form, so you have this P. Think about this as a big matrix, and it's the product of two matrices. Uh, next slide then uh, you could think that you can compute the optimal value function as the, the fixed point. And, and uh, when you're computing this fixed point, you could reorder uh, the order of the operations and go from small spaces to small spaces. So work in compressed spaces, so to say. So if you have this factorization, where in factorization you find yourself in a much smaller space than originally, uh, then this can work pretty well. Um, OK, next slide. So this is uh, what I call the, the magic of uh, factorization, uh, that you can solve really large problems uh, uh, with very little computation in an exact form. Uh, and there are many examples of, of models of this type. And uh, this was joint work done with this uh, wonderful colleagues. Next slide. All right. Um, so the next challenge is seem to realize your model is not the, the same thing as uh, the, the true model. So what can you do? Uh, so can we skip uh, one slide and go to the second slide from here? Or third slide, actually. Uh, so this this slide. Uh, so I want to, to talk about this uh, a little bit because uh, it's a very nice result. It's it's from 1978 by Wardwet. Uh, and um, it expresses the error that you will see if you're planning for an approximate model, uh, which is not the true model, as the function of the model errors. And what's nice about this is that the model error is not measured in a worst case way, but the model error is first projected through the optimal value function underlying the approximate model. So it's like a, a, a projection that applies before. So it's, it shows you that it's enough to control the modeling error that the approximate value function that you, are, you should be able to compute if you can solve that model anyways, uh, which is really, really nice uh, because it opens up uh, possibilities for, for learning and it can lead to much tighter bonds than other um, more conservative bonds. So, right. Uh, so let's keep uh, a 
few slides. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's give this one so you can improve upon this in the fact of matter. And this was a very this uh, student that was done a while ago. Uh, so how do we control these modeling errors? Uh, so if you are in the bad situation, it's kind of too bad. You should be pessimistic. But the main point, again, is that you should better represent this uncertainty in your model. Uh, if you can learn online, then maybe you can take uh, it to your advantage that you know that uh, the uh, this level of suboptimality that you're going to suffer depends on the model in this particular way that was shown in this error box. Next slide. So how do we put this to good work in online uh, learning? Next slide. Um, so uh, next slide. So we could use the optimism principle, which goes back to Lloyd Robbins, uh, 1985 paper, which just says that keep all those models that are consistent with your data and, and uh, just plan optimistically. So you're going to solve this joint optimization problem where you're optimizing across all the models, all the policies. And then the only remaining question is, how do you construct these models that are consistent with the data? Next slide. And so here, uh, with a uh, new work, uh, soon to be on archive, uh, we're proposing a way to do this by taking this error bond from hard width in a serious way. So we call it the resulting procedure by targeted regression. Next slide. Uh, and so uh, what happens is that you have this iterative method that had a uh, previous class of models uh, and used uh, the previous class to come up with a value function uh, with an optimistic planning procedure from the last iteration. And it uses this value function as uh, um, the basis of a regression problem. Uh, you're setting up a loss where you're trying to predict uh, values of this value function at next states along your transitions. And you keep all the models uh, for which these prediction errors are small. So th this is how you're using uh, the inequality that we had before uh, together with data to arrive at this model class. Next slide. So if you do this, then, then you can uh, show a nice result that shows that uh, your regret, which is the loss due to not knowing which environment you are in, is not going to grow too fast, or the average loss due to learning is going to decay at a one way root rate. Um, and uh, next slide. Um, and uh, so, if you if you try this, uh, then uh, you will see that uh, this uh, this spe specific method that uses this value targeted regression can achieve much smaller regret on challenging exploration problems where comparators are not doing that well. Next slide. Uh, while it's not necessarily learning a super precise model, so the y axis here in the previous uh, slides, sir, I should have said uh, smaller numbers of the y axis are better. Here, uh, again, smaller numbers are better. These, these are errors. Uh, and um, so you see that the, in blue, the new algorithm is not doing as well. It's, it's doing pretty well. Uh, but this is just like some environment that was so to be hard for exploration problems. Next slide. But uh, we can also design other environments that I don't have time to discuss, in which you can show that this algorithm doesn't even bother learning a precise model. So here uh, in the lower graph, you see that the model error for this uh, new algorithm, which is shown in, in blue, um, is really, really high, while it achieves a low cumulative regret. Uh, so in blue, in the first graph, uh, you see low numbers. Uh, so it kind of like ignores irrelevant aspects of uh, of the environment. Uh, so which is we find it uh, really nice. Uh, next slide. Uh, so um, we are not the only one to discover that this idea might uh, work. So in independent work, my colleagues uh, at uh, DMind came up with this algorithm. 
mu zero, which uh, sneakily uses the same object, even it achieves a uh, state of the art results in uh, various challenging uh, problems. Uh, next slide. All right, so in summary, uh, model-based reinforcement learning is challenging, but has a lot of potential, it has some unique advantages, uh, like generalization via uh, planning or inference. Uh, um, I think one important thing uh, that is often overlooked is that uh, I think for good performance, either offline or online, uh, you should aim for representing model uncertainty. This shouldn't be optional. Um, and uh, other lessons that I drew from my experience with uh, this type of uh, problem is that you should avoid unstable algorithms, uh, and there are algorithms which are less unstable than others, uh, so choose your algorithm wisely. Uh, some models are better fit for planning, uh, so I mentioned these factor models uh, that are really, really great. Uh, and uh, it's uh, very interesting that uh, right now we are discovering that uh, when you're thinking about models, you don't necessarily need to uh, think about uh, modeling all fine details of the environment. And you can have this really focused uh, modeling where you take the task, as the aspects of the task into account, uh, which was done in one particle way in value target regression. And I find that this uh potentially opens up um, uh, the possibility of, of scaling up to even more challenging environments. And uh, so far, I've been talking about state abstraction, but of course, time and action abstraction are also pretty important. Uh, and uh, I think there the big question is how to, in a seamless fashion, integrate uh, time and action abstraction into the frameworks that I was talking about. Um, next slide. I'm done. So these are the references. Uh, so for going over time. Uh, um, so these are uh, in red. You can see the references for the for the planning type of work. Uh, in blue, you see uh, the seam to real, the error bound type of work, and uh, the new work on value target direction is shown in green. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Shaba. Um, any questions? We have one question from uh, from YouTube. I'm going to read that to you, and then we'll see if more questions come up. Um, so the question is: uh, Is it viable to use reinforcement learning for parameter parameter optimization? You can't stop people from using reinforcement learning for anything. Uh, <laughs> whether it's a good idea or not, I don't know. Um, I, that's really hard to say. So if the problem has some sequential aspect and you can take advantage of the sequential aspect of the problem, uh, then you could try. Uh, reinforcement learning is, is uh, like, I don't think that it's at the level of maturity as convex optimization. Like, it's no secret that like... Uh, we don't have a mind map of uh, the level of detail that we have about like other optimization settings. So if you want to use reinforcement learning, sure, go ahead. Uh, uh, your mileage may vary. We have another question. You might be able to see it in the q and I don't know if you can see it. Uh, so it's from Chris Drummond. He's, he's uh, asking, you seem to be suggesting fitting the value function. Does that exclude policy search? I don't want to exclude anything. Uh, I'm an inclusive guy. Just because I'm uh, discussing certain aspects uh, doesn't mean that other aspects should be completely ignored. Uh, so now, as the policy search, um, I think, first of all, uh, this categorization and, uh, of, of uh, algorithms into uh, different categories, like this is a policy-based algorithm, this is a value-based algorithm, I think it's very often borderline meaningless, because many of these algorithms <coughs> sneakishly are going to use the... <coughs> 
<coughs> sorry, the other uh, components, and then maybe it's up to the author's angle at which they write at this derivation. But you can specifically mention that some ergotums that are derived as policy-based ergotums are really can be derived as value-based ergotums as well, and vice versa. So I, I would rather uh, encourage everyone to think about like uh, the unification and like how to join these ergotums than to uh, to think about like how to separate them. And like there is a limited usefulness of even talking about this uh, this policy-based or um, or value-based ergotums or uh, or search ergotums or uh, because these ergotums can complement each other and and work together very nicely. So I wouldn't argue against uh, policy-based methods. At the same time, there are some signs that pure policy search is just not a good idea. For example, uh, and you can't hope uh, to achieve much with with that approach. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, do you have any other questions? If yes, can you please post them to Q&A or on the Slack? Uh, I don't see any more uh, questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to um, maybe end with a comment from, from Slack. Somebody just said, uh, despite the technological issues, really interesting talk. So I want to echo that and just uh, thank you for uh, for the interesting uh, keynote we had today. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'll do good clapping for everybody else. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Shava. Thank you. Um, and uh, so we'll end the session here. We're running, because of these technical difficulties, we're running a little bit late. So the award session will be delayed by five, 10 minutes. And we'll start uh, a little bit before three. So you're welcome to join. It's in the other, another Zoom meeting room. OK. So thank you again, thank you. for the uh, interesting talk. And thank you, Luisa, for uh, sharing this session. Oh, thank you for all the good work that you're doing to set, to set this up.